Do you have your Bibles? Have you got your Bibles? Okay, very good. Don't fall asleep on me yet. Um, all right. I'm going to ask you, if you ha have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4 again. 1 John chapter 4. The Apostle John writing to this church, dealing with the issue of false teaching, false teachers that have left the church, but their influence is still in the church, and they have uh, absolutely contradicted what they have heard from the Apostle John. A straight-up contradiction um, as it relates to Jesus, as it relates to their relationship with God and their relationship with one another, um, a very upside down false teaching that we call Gnosticism, which is the Greek word for knowledge. In fact, you'll find that John over and over again in this letter will say, you know, or, or we know. And he, he, he uses that word a lot to say this is actually the truth. This is true knowledge. What I'm telling you, these false teachers think they know. This is what they claim, but they don't actually know the truth. And so we are in 1 John chapter 4, and let's go ahead and pick back up again in verse 7. We covered a good bit of this, but let's just start in verse 7 again, and we'll read through to the end of the chapter. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, meaning the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now we continue on. This is what we'll cover today. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So today we want to pick up on this theme of lovers, liars, and losers. There are lovers, there are liars, and there are losers in this portion of 1 John chapter 4. And with that said, let's go ahead and open up in prayer and ask the Lord to, to help us. Heavenly Father, we realize that you worked through the Apostle John. Nearly 2,000 years ago, you had him pen this letter to this church. And we see that there is such a significant emphasis on love. Not just love that comes by way of our speech. We know how easy it is to say, I love you, to a person and it just be words. Unfortunately, we know how easy it is to say, we love you, and yet that often just be words, not followed up with actions. But we see here today that we should love because you first loved us, that it should just it should be the natural state of who we are as your children because you loved us and because you have shown that love and shed that love abroad in our hearts. Then we ought also not only to love you in word and in 
action, but we ought to love one another, both in word and in action. And I pray today that your spirit would would just make this real to our hearts and it would not just be more head knowledge, Lord, but it would also be heart knowledge. It would be knowledge that would be followed up by action, that it would be practical and that would be real. So I pray, I ask that you would help me to speak your word with clarity and with practical application and you would help each one of us to have ears willing to hear, eyes willing to see, to understand your will for us and to hear the voice of your spirit today through your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen Amen. and amen. I believe with all of my heart, certainly if we were to ask the lost, those that are unsaved, what's one of the biggest issues with the church? Maybe if you were to ask people, why don't you go to church? I think one of the things people would say if they thought about it for some length of time, unfortunately, is, you know, what they talk and what they say they believe and then how they live out their lives just doesn't jive. It, it, It just doesn't. And unfortunately, that is to our shame in the church oftentimes that we say we believe something and we say we have wagered our soul on that something. And yet our lives, or at least the lives of some, do not measure up. Did not plan on saying this, and I take no joy in saying it, but once again this past week, a story was brought up that's been in the news for those that would follow it. It's been in the news for quite some time of a very well-known Christian teacher and apologist. He has traveled all over the world. I have many of his books in my library. Uh, a, A man that I thought, if ever I could say, here's a man that, boy, he just embodies Christianity. He believes what he says. And, and I don't know that he didn't believe it, but he didn't live it because a huge, huge scandal broke out. And it was mentioned again uh, on Friday. And it's, it's been even on the major newscasts. And it's sad. It's a really sad thing because people look at that and they say, if that's Christianity, I'm talking about bad stuff. I'm talking about years and years of sexual abuse of young women. I'm talking about years and years, not only of abuse, but then when those women would come back to this individual and say, look, I can't live with this anymore. This, this, you know, I've got to talk and we, I've got to get this out. He would say to them, it's over and over again. If you do that, the kingdom of God will suffer because you know, you'll, you'll cause such a scandal. So you can't, you've got to keep it to yourself. This is what he would say. And then when they would say, I'm still going forward with it, I have to for the cleansing as it was of my own conscience, I have to do this. Then this man would turn around and sue them. He would sue them and say they're liars when they were telling the truth and he was lying. Folks, that's, you you know, that's not something you can just sweep under the carpet. When you begin to attack those that you've already victimized a second time, there's something wrong. And so I understand that in the, in, in the world, they look at the church and they say, what's to believe? What is their good within this? And I look at John's emphasis on love and the fact that we should love one another. And I say, you know, oftentimes this is missing in church. And this is why God has John point this out. And apparently, folks, apparently the false teachers, there was something they were doing or the way they were living their life was such that, that, that they were not demonstrating love because John brings this up and he says, we know God because we love God. Do you hear me? We know God and it's demonstrated through our love for God. And so there's something significant in this that John is trying to get across to these people. I don't know exactly what was going on with the false teachers. Did they just walk around with puffed out chests and real you know, arrogant and real proud. I I think maybe that was some of it. Oh, John's wrong. We're right. We're super Christians. We're super spiritual. We know the truth about God. And I, I, you know, my impression is, is that somehow that was not translating in a loving manner at all. And so the Holy Spirit tells John, you need to emphasize this thing of love. And he does that. And if you remember last week, I just quickly go over with you in verses seven through 10, we talked about the example of love. And that example is God's gift of his son. God gave his son to die for us. There is no greater example of love 
than that, to willingly do that. Then in verses 11 through 16, we saw that God's love was made complete in the believer's life through our love for one another. And I gave you three reasons why we should love others. Number one, because it's a reflection of God's love that's already been showered upon us. This is mentioned in verse 11. Number two, when we love others, God's love is made complete in us. That's verse 12. And then number three, when we love, we actually confess and witness to the truth that God is love. When we love, we, it's another act of witnessing to the world that we believe in this truth about God. And that's in verses 15 and 16. And that's where we left off last time. So now we're going to pick up in verse 17. And we're going to look, first of all, at verses 17 and 18. And we're going to see that God's love is made complete in our confidence on the day of judgment. The fact that we can stand and have confidence on the day of judgment demonstrates that God's love has been made complete or mature in our lives because this is what it says. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. And then he says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, first of all, he says that there is this day of judgment coming. Jesus spoke about this in John 6, 40. Jesus says this, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And Jesus says, I myself will raise him up on the last day. When we talk about judgment, we talk about the last day. There is a day coming, that day in court for every human being where God will say, I have, I have offered the gift of grace, the gift of my son, but there is coming a day where everyone will have to stand and give an account. Have you believed? Have you accepted? Or have you rejected? And hence, based on that, everyone will receive their reward as it was, either heaven or hell, based on that. So there is a day of judgment, but Jesus says, if you believe on me, I'll raise you up on that last day. So there is no need, as he says in verse, 15, in, in verse 17, there's no need for fear there. There's boldness when we think about that day of judgment. Jesus also said this in John chapter 5, Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and they will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So there is this running theme throughout the scriptures of a day of judgment. It is coming one day. And John says that, that God's love is made complete in us because we can have confidence when it comes to the day of judgment. Christians should not be living in fear when it comes to the return of Christ and the looming judgment that will be put upon all those who dwell upon the face of the earth. Everyone will stand in that judgment, but Christians... Do not fear that. There is a confidence within us, not because of ourselves, but because his love has been perfected in us. And, and we've adopted the Greek word for fear into our English vocabulary. You know what the word is? Some of you, if you think about it, what's, what's another word for fear? No, not baloney. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not the word I'm looking for. When you're scared of things, they say you have something, and then they put this word on the end of it. A phobia. Somebody said it. I heard it. Phobia. That is the Greek word for fear. And we've adopted it into our English dictionary. Phobia. And there's all kinds of phobias that are listed, right? I mean, you know, I mean, um, acrophobia. What's that? That's the fear of heights. That's people that they don't want to go up on airplanes, or even they go to the top of a building. They don't want to look over. They get dizzy. They, you know, acrophobia. Another one that starts with A that I think about is arachnophobia. Do you know what that is? Fear of spiders. My daughter in California demonstrated that yesterday. I'm telling on her when she called her mother and I in an absolute panic and said, there's a spider in the shower. There's a spider in the shower. And, and I, it, it, I, I, I put the water on and he went down through the, um, the drain. And is he gone? Is he gone? And of course, as a good, loving dad, I said, no, nah, he's probably just right there on the edge, <laughs> ready to come back up. 
And of course, her, her, her mom, my wife, oh, your dad's just kidding with you, it's okay. And so there is this thing called arachnophobia, fear of spiders, There's all kinds of phobias. Interestingly enough, John is writing about a type of phobia. It's called chrysisphobia, fear of judgment, because chrysis is the word for judgment. And there was a fear of judgment that the Greeks had, that people had the thought of the unknown of either the gods coming now in the here and now and killing you while you're still alive, or if you pass over all kinds of terrible things in the underworld, in the world beyond, whatever they would believe. There was all kinds of fear when it came to judgment. And John is writing about this fear of judgment, chrysisphobia, and, and he's telling them, we now have confidence when we think about the day of judgment, we don't stand in fear of it. This was mentioned in Sunday school this morning. We were talking about the rapture. And we were talking about the fact that in the 1970s and 80s, you know, a lot of movies came out concerning the rapture. And often for many people, it would produce fear. And, you know, we, we kind of dug down on that a little bit in Sunday school. And, and I have to say, for the child of God, the idea and the thought of the rapture should not produce fear. There's something wrong if we are fearful of the day that the Lord is coming back. That, that's a signal, a red flag, that something is wrong with us. Because if the love of God has been perfected in us as it should be, then the thought of the rapture is just exactly the same thought of dad, if you would, is coming home after a long trip, and I can't wait to see him. I know he's coming in the door, and I'm going to go, and he's going to hug me, and I'm going to hug him. I'm so, so happy that my father, as it was, is coming home. That should be the mindset for the Christian when it comes to the rapture. We want to see Jesus. This world is not our home. There's, there, there's nothing except confidence because of the love of God. God has changed us, so I don't have to sit in fear of judgment anymore. Amen? Amen. And this is such an important point. We have boldness, verse 17, in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. So there's no, there should be no concern and no fear when it comes to Christians, especially as it regards the day of judgment. But I just ask you this very simply. If people are afraid, it's usually because of one of three things. It's usually either because of something in the past that haunts them, and some of us know what that's all about, or it's something in the present that maybe upsets them or worries them, or it's something in the future that they feel somehow threatens them. That's usually where this concept of fear comes from. Either haunts us from the past, or it dogs us right now in the present, or it threatens us from the future. And so we're worried, and so people live in fear all the time. But God says that perfect love casts out fear. The Lord doesn't want us to walk in fear. Why would I have to fear if I have a giant lion right beside me that I know loves me and is not going to turn on me, I ain't worried about walking through the jungle. I'm just not because this is the biggest, most ferocious line that can take care of anything else. And, and I'm walking side by side as it was with the line of the tribe of Judah. Amen. And he's going to take care of me. And he loves me. Yeah, those paws can tear into other things, but there, there will be paws of love for his own. Amen. So I'm not worried about that. And John says, perfect love cast out fear. Sometimes, you know, those three things, past, present, future, sometimes it's a combination of all those things. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, can I just tell you, our past has been taken care of. Amen. We've been forgiven. We've been cleansed. You can't go backwards. Don't worry about it. Thank, I'm glad we can't go backwards. Sometimes we say, oh, if I could just go back and change that, you'd make it worse. Somehow, that's what, that's what we'd end up doing. No, our past has been taken care of. Our future has been taken care of. But not only that, I love it because the author of Hebrews says that he's the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen? Sometimes it's the and today that we get worried about. Well, what about today? God's taking care of you. And he's also taking care of the day of judgment. Jesus died on Calvary's cross for us. He took the punishment for our sins. He was the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. And now the love of God has been perfected in the hearts of his children. Amen. And so we need not fear. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27 says. So we don't fear future judgment because Jesus has already done this work. 
listen, for, for a Christian, judgment is not future, it's past, if you think about it. It should not be what's coming. It's what's already happened, and Jesus has already taken care of that. Amen? Our sins have already been dealt with on the cross, and they're not going to be brought before us again. That's done. Taken as far as the east is from the west, our sins have been separated from us into a sea of forgetfulness. Amen. God's not going to hold them to our account anymore. It's over. It's done with. We have to live that way and perfect love allows us to live that way. If you think about it, fear is actually the beginning of torment. That's what verse 18 tells us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment. Do you really believe God wants his children to walk around in torment all the time? Constantly just in, in fear. I'm not talking about the fear of God. That's, that's for a different subject, and it's an important subject that the church needs to deal with. There is a righteous fear of God, which is a good thing. But I'm talking about that fear that brings torment that the enemy uses to try and destroy us and tear us apart or paralyze us so that we can't do anything. People sit up in bed all night and they're just constantly playing it over in their mind again and again and again. Perfect love cast out that kind of fear. That kind of fear leads only to torment. And we are not in a relationship with God that is fear-based, if you would. But we should be in a relationship with God that is love-based. It's very important that we get this, folks. And I know people can go off on one side or the other. We get this. There can always be abuses on anything. But John gives us the truth. God's love is perfected in us. Interestingly enough, going one more time back to verse 17, we have boldness because he, because as he is, so are we in this world. What John is saying there is, is that if we are living out lives that receive the same type of response that Jesus did, remember we've already talked about that, that the world listens to its own, it loves its own, it applauds its own, and we sometimes say, wow, the world, boy, they really don't like me. I'm not trying to be a jerk or anything else, but they just don't like me. Love has been perfected in us that they are not seeing you. They are seeing the Lord, and that's what they're rebelling against. But as our life measures up with the Lord's, not in, in the sense of, of perfection. Jesus never sinned, ever once. That's not what I'm talking about. But as we are identified with Christ... The love of God comes to abide within our heart and we realize, okay, this is okay. They hated him and they hate me. I, that, that's just the way it is. His life and his love is perfected in me. Amen? And so we don't fear, verse 18. There's no fear in love. This love cast out fear. And so God wants his children to live in an atmosphere, listen to me, of love and confidence, not fear and torment. If your relationship with God is all fear and torment, if it's just constantly, oh, I let God down again and again, and oh no, and now I've got to find a way to make it up to him. And th th that's not what God wants. We should be in a relationship of love and confidence before the Lord. Now, because we love him, there may be times that he says, ah, now you got off track here. Let's put you back on track. And we say, hallelujah. Yes, thank you, Father. Thank you for doing that. No problem with that at all. But our relationship should be one of love and confidence, not fear and torment. That is the devil's work. It is not the work of the spirit, but the work of the devil to torment you. So you say, oh, this is just the Holy Spirit keeps convicting me and I'm tormented. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws and he convicts us, but it's not with a view towards torment. That's the work of the devil. Amen? And none of us here need live in that. And so God says that, that perfect love casts out fear. Because the fearful person is one that is not made perfect in love. And what that means is not made complete. All right? So the, the person that's living in fear has not been made complete. Um, and, and, and this is what the Lord means by that. Perfect love, here in this verse, appears to be a love that is made complete. It's a love that is acted out. Again, if we are like him in this life, to the extent that our lives are characterized by sacrificial love, then that love is casting out fear. Because we're, we're walking as Jesus walked. The Lord is in us and working through us. And when our, lives, when our lives evidence Christian love, we know that we've passed from death unto life. 
Verse 14 of chapter 3 tells us. We know that we belong to the truth. Verse 19 of chapter 3 tells us. We know that we have been born of God. Verse 7 of chapter 4 tells us. And we live in God and He in us. Verses 12 and 16 tell us. So when this love is made complete, perfected in us, we're walking with a confidence, not with fear. Amen? God doesn't want you to fear, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So if you're walking in fear today, understand God wants to perfect his love in you. And then, of course, we're told we love him because he first loved us. And so I want to talk about the fact that love for God must be accomplished by a love of fellow believers. Because the first thing we're told is that we love him because he first loved us. So it doesn't start with us. It starts with God. He reached out to us. But then we're told this, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. So here we have, this is the seventh time in John's little letter here that we have this phrase, if someone says. If someone says, this is the seventh time he's mentioned this. And we've already heard this again and again and again. And what is it? Whenever, whenever John says, if someone says this, but they do that. What is he pointing to? It's a warning, and he's pointing to those that are pretenders. That's where the liars come in. Those that pretend to love God, those that pretend to know God. John says here in verse 20, if someone says, I love God, and they hate their brother, John says, you're a liar. You're a pretender. You're not the real thing. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen John says, how can he love God who he has not seen? This is the command and we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. If, if we love God, if the love of God is real in our hearts, then the love of our brothers and sisters is going to be overflowing. Folks, this is as practical and real as it gets. The Bible talks about love. We could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we've got that chapter that many people call the love chapter. It's read at weddings, and it doesn't really, it, it's okay to read at weddings, but it's really written in the context of church life, of people that are butting heads in the church. Thankfully, that's never happened at Berean Assembly. Everyone gets along, loves one another, there's never any problems. It's just, it's wonderful. I mean, this is like Mayberry here. But in some churches, in some churches, there are sometimes conflicts. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he wrote this chapter on love and he says, listen, you can have all the spiritual gifts you want. I'm paraphrasing here if you would. You can speak in tongues all you want or you can have faith to move mountains. You can do all these things. But if you are not walking in love for your brothers and sisters in the church, you're nothing. You're just like a, 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 a symbols that are being crashed over and over again. The gong being hit over and over again. You're making all kinds of noise, but it means nothing to God. And if we were actually to go to 1 Corinthians 13 and look just at one verse, we could look at several because there's a big description of love and what love signifies. But I'm just going to go to verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 13. And this is what we're told about love. Four things about love. Many of you have heard me talk about this before. We're going to talk about it again today. Love bears all things. Love believes all things, love hopes all things, and love endures all things. This is what love does. So love for God must be accompanied by love for fellow believers. That's the gist of verses 19 through 21. And I want to break the, just this one part down. What does it mean that love bears all things? Well, that word for, for bear there, it's not the grizzly bear and the polar bear, all right? But, but it, it's a word that translated means it's a love that endures. It's a love that sustains. It covers. It conceals. It's a love that contains something, doesn't let it burst out and go forth. And I love what Adam Clark has to say, old-time commentator. He wrote these words. He says, we know that it is an outstanding and distinctive characteristic of love to cover and conceal the fault of another person. And this perfectly agrees with what Peter says of love in 1 Peter 4, 8. It shall cover a multitude of sins. Love conceals everything that should be concealed. It betrays no secret. It retains the grace that's given to it, and it goes on to continual increase. 
Listen now, a person under the influence of this love never makes the sins, mistakes, faults, or imperfections of any person the subject of conversation. He covers them as far as he can. And if he alone knows about them, he retains them in his heart as far as he ought in good conscience. So when we are operating in the love of God, it's a love that bears or endures or conceals or contains things, which means if you come upon some bit of information, true or not, and it is not a wide known, it is not something that's out there for the whole world to see, you're not the one that's supposed to take the wings of an eagle and go rushing out and making sure the whole world knows about it. We call that gossip. And you say, oh, but other people have to know. I ask you this simple question. If you have a child that you love with all of your heart, is it your first instinct when that child does something wrong to run to the phone and to call all of your neighbors and all of your friends and say, can I just tell you what bad things my kid did? My kid, my kid got pulled over by the cops for speeding. I'm going to tell everybody about it. My kid did this. My kid did that. No, you wouldn't do it. No one here would do it. You would not have that attitude. Then why, my friends, in the house of God, do we hear something and then run with it and tell everybody else about it? Oh, you should hear what's going on in their household. Let me tell you about this. They, they told me, now this is just between us. Oh, it's always just between us, which the us is... Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, twenty, a hundred, whatever. That's the way it always works. True love, listen, Paul says true love conceals all things. And that works perfectly with God. Do you want God going out and telling everyone else what you've done? You want God telling everybody else? Let me tell you about this guy's past. Let me tell you about this woman's past. Does any of us here want that? Is that what we expect? No. And that's not the love of God. The love of God conceals he forgives and he conceals. Now, there are times where sometimes we have to pay the piper in terms of circumstances or in terms of consequences of those circumstances. You go out and you rob the store. Okay, guess what? You're going to have to deal with that. And if they, if they catch you, then you're dealing with that, right? And if you're a Christian, you say, oh, Lord, forgive me. You, should, you wouldn't have done it if you're a Christian. But if you become a Christian, you say, okay, I got to make this right. That's how that works. But we don't go out and run around and tell tales on one another. That's not how love works. Not only that, love bears all things, but it believes all things. Again, Adam Clark says it this way. When there's no place left for believing good of a person, then love comes in with its, ho or excuse me, it is ever ready, I'm sorry, it is ever ready to believe the best of every person and will believe no evil of anyone, but on the most indisputable evidence. It gladly receives whatever may tend to the advantage of any person whose character may have suffered from humiliation and shame. Even if the person justly feels shame because of their misconduct, love still believes all things. In other words, it always, it's, it's, imp, it, it's, it's, uh, it's characteristic is I automatically believe the best of this person. I don't automatically believe the worst. Again, I wish this worked in the church as it should, but oftentimes it doesn't. There are some people that are just, their ear is ready for one bad thing, and, they're, and you know what they say? I knew it. I knew it. I knew that's what they were like. I just knew it. Well, then love is not believing all things. You think of the person that you treasure with all of your heart, a spouse, whoever it might be, and you've known them your whole life, and a stranger comes up to you and says to you, they just murdered someone yesterday. Your first inclination is not going to believe is not going to be to believe them. Your first inclination is to be, are you crazy? You're nuts. I know them. They're, 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 they're this person. This is what we do when we love someone. We say, I don't believe that because that's the inclination of our heart. And if, and if you had that spouse and someone, a stranger came up and said that about your spouse and you said, I knew it, I believe, then you've got problems. You've had huge problems of, of all kinds. Of, there's no love operating in that marriage if that's, if that's what it comes down to. That's not good. True love believes the best. Folks, we need to believe the best for one another in the church. Our heart, should, our, our heart and our mind should not immediately go towards the worst thing. And if someone tells us something, our heart should be in a position of, no, nah, I'm just... You're going to have to give absolute proof because I believe the best of this person. That's how a heart functioning with love actually works. And again, that is God's love being perfected in us. 
Can you imagine God always up there in heaven and here comes Satan? We know he's the accuser of the brethren. We know he did this with Job. Comes up and starts yakking about everybody, right? And oh, all these people, they only serve you for this or that. And then what does God say? Have you considered my servant Job? Satan says, oh, let me do this and that and the other. And, you know, and all these things. And God is even handed. And God doesn't just immediately say, well, Satan, you're right. Doggone that Job. He's nothing but trouble. And I knew he would be this way. I knew he would fall flat. No. Love believes all things. It bears all things and it believes all things. But not only that, love hopes all things. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, when there's no place left for believing good of a person, then love comes in with its hope where it could not work by its faith. And it begins immediately to make allowances and excuses as far as a good conscience can permit. And further, it anticipates the repentance of the transgressor and their restoration to the good opinion of society and their place in the church from whence they have fallen. True love operates with a hope that says, okay, even if you've given me the evidence, and okay, I can't deny the evidence, but you know what? I know this person. They're going to recover. With God's help, they're going to make it. They're going to recover. They're going to come back. That should be the attitude of love that we have one for another. Amen? That's how it has to be. It, it, it cannot, we're not operating in love if we say, I, I have no hope for that person. No, nah, they're just, oh, they're worthless. They're not going to make it then we're not operating in love because love hopes all things. It anticipates that that person is going to be restored. Amen? And again, I say to you, with your children who maybe have gone wayward, don't tell me a mama doesn't say and, and have that kind of hope in her heart that her child is going to come back. Amen, moms? Am I right, moms? Come on. You know why? Because that's love. And that's the type of love, God's love, that we should all be working with and demonstrating one towards another. Last one. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love endures all things. It bears up under all persecutions and mistreatment from open enemies and professed friends. It tolerates difficulties with a level mind. And it never says, it never says of any trial, any affliction, any insult, this is too much. It can't be endured. That's it. I can't take any more. Love never says that. And again, mom no matter how often or dad that that wayward child has hung up on you or gotten mad at you or, you know, walked away from you, do you not still through all of that say, but I still love them. They're my child and that's not going to change. Can I get again an amen? amen? Yes, because they're blood, they're family, they're our own. God's love is that way for us. Aren't you glad that God's love is an enduring love? Hallelujah. If his love was like our love that sometimes can change the spur of a moment, like a teenage girl or boy that has 10 different loves in two hours in school, if our love was like that, we would be in trouble. If God's love was like that for us, we would be in serious trouble. We, we're done for. His love is an enduring love. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures even ill treatment. In the church, even if somebody is woken up on the wrong side of the bed, so to speak, and they come in. That's not the time to come to pastor and say, they, 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 they didn't say hi to me. They were upset with me. They call me every week. They didn't call me this week. They're, they're, they're just so mean. True love understands and recognizes that, you know what? Maybe you're not the only person going through something. Maybe they went through something last week that they've not shared with you, and it's been pretty rough on them. See, we got to walk in one another's shoes, and we got to demonstrate that love and give the benefit of the doubt to one another. And that's the type of love that John is talking about here. And he says, if anyone says, I love God, and they don't love their brother, come on. How can they say they, they, they love God whom they've never even seen? They have no eye contact with, but their brothers and sisters right in front of them, they can't love them? John says something wrong with that. Something is wrong with that. But instead, we walk in love because he first loved us. That's the whole thing. Our love proceeds forth. It's been completed through what Christ did, and it is completed in our lives as we demonstrate practically love one for another. Amen? That's what we have to do, folks. That's what God calls us to do. 
So we're lovers. We're not liars. And we're not losers because the losers are those that, that say that they have a relationship with God, but they actually don't. Just like the liars. And they lose out. And they lose out on everything in their life because they've not heeded the simple exhortation of Scripture and they've not allowed the love of Christ to live both in them and then to be demonstrated through them in their lives. That's a person that's a loser. So in this sense, how many here you want to be lovers in a good way? I'm talking about you can raise your hand on this. Amen. You want to be known that you're a lover, a lover of God and a lover of people. Amen. That's a good thing. Don't if you take it the other way, we'll pray for you. We'll get all that <laughs> junk out of you if you're thinking something else. So God says that that his love is made real. Brother Ivor, would you come? His love is made real in us. By the fact that we, we live with the nature of that love and it, dem it demonstrates itself through the genuine love that we have one for another. And so today I would just encourage you, we are called, we are called to demonstrate love one for another. It starts in the heart, but then it has to be completed through the actions. Because we can't say, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then the action shows something else. Some of you know what that's about too. You've had human beings that say, I love you. Oh, I love you with all my heart. And then when they're done with you and they get what they want from you, they're out the door. They didn't really love you, did they? It was just talk. God says the love that we have is not just a talk love, but it's a walk love. We show it in our lives. Can I encourage you even today, maybe you're in this place and maybe even before the service began, maybe even during the service, the enemy came in and tried to drop that thought in your mind about someone. And all of a sudden, oh, I, you become angry. You become distrustful. You, something, something happens. Reject that. Walk in love. Walk in love with your brother or sister in Christ. Then the world will see. Then people that don't believe may start believing when they see Christians walking in love. We're called to do it. We haven't made it up. It's in the Bible. We're called to do it. With God's help, let's do it. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this exhortation to be reminded that your love has to be completed in us and it's completed in us as we show love one for another in very practical ways. You've called us not to live in fear. We have confidence when it comes to the day of judgment, not because of ourselves, but because of you. And because as you are, so are we in this world. Lord, you walked the walk, and Lord, as we see that working out in our lives, as we see the world responding to us as it did to you, Lord, it gives us confidence to know that we're in the truth, that we actually are part of your family. And we thank you for that. We don't want to walk in fear and torment. We want to walk in love and confidence. And I pray for brothers and sisters here that we would be able to do that, not just say it, but live it out, actually demonstrate it, Lord. Would you help us today to do that? To demonstrate love. We thank you because you demonstrated it to us on Calvary. You sent your only begotten son, the greatest demonstration of love ever imagined. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We thank you. Minister to your people today. Take care of every need that's represented in this church, in this place, to those that are listening watching, Lord, minister to each and every one. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. A beautiful song to remind us that we're called to love one another, to walk in that love. Brother Ivor's going to lead us in that. And I'm going to ask if you would stand and let's just sing this through a couple of times and then we'll be dismissed.